You say that some desire us for our wealth, some for our shapeliness, our looks, our health, some for our singing, others for our dancing, some for our gentleness and dalliant glancing, and some because our hands are soft and small. By your account the devil gets us all. You say what castle wall can be so strong as to hold out against the siege for long? And if her looks are foul, you say that she is hot for every man that she can see, leaping upon them with a spaniel's airs until she finds a man to buy her wares. Never was goose upon the lake so gray, but that she found a gander, so you say. You say it's hard to keep a girl controlled, if she's the kind that no one wants to hold. That's what you say as you stump off to bed, you brute. You say no man of sense would wed, that is, not if he wants to go to heaven. Wild thunderbolts and fire from the seven planets descend and break your withered neck. You say that buildings falling into wreck and smoke and scolding women are the three things that will drive a man from home? Dear me, what ails the poor old man to grumble so? We women hide our faults to let them show once we are safely married, so you say. There's a fine proverb for a popinjay. You say that oxen, asses, hounds, and horses can be tried out on various ploys and courses, and basins too, and dishes when you buy them. Spoons, chairs, and furnishings, a man can try them, as he can try a suit of clothes, no doubt, but no one ever tries a woman out until he's married her old dottered crow, and then you say she lets her vices show. You also say we count it for a crime unless you praise our beauty all the time, unless you're always pouring on our faces and call us pretty names in public places, or if you fail to treat me to a feast upon my birthday, presents at the least, or to respect my nurse and her gray hairs, or be polite to all my maids upstairs, and to my father's cronies and his spies, that's what you say, old barrel full of lies. Then there's our young apprentice, handsome Johnny, because he has crisp hair that shines as bonny as finest gold and squires me up and down. You show your low suspicions in a frown. I wouldn't have him, not if you died tomorrow. And tell me this, God punish you with sorrow. Why do you hide the keys of copper doors? It's just as much my property as yours. Do you want to make an idiot of your wife? Now, by the Lord that gave me soul and life, you shan't have both. You can't be such a naughty as think to keep my goods and have my body. You must do without whatever you say. And do you need to spy on me all day? I think you'd like to lock me in your coffer. Go where you please, dear wife, you ought to offer. Amuse yourself, I shan't give ear to malice. I know you for a virtuous wife, Dame Alice. We cannot love a husband who takes charge of where we go. We like to be at large. Above all other men, may God confer his blessings on that wise astrologer, Sir Ptolemy, who in his Almagest set, has set this proverb down, Of men the best and wisest care not who may have in hand the conduct of the world. I understand that means if you've enough, you shouldn't care how prosperously other people fare. Be sure, old dotard, if you call the bluff, you'll get your evening rations right enough. He's a mean fellow that lets no man handle his lantern when it's just to light a candle. He has lost no light, he hasn't felt the strain, and you have light enough, so why complain? And when a woman tries a mild display in dress or costly ornament, you say, it is a danger to her chastity, and then bad luck to you. Start making free with Bible tags in the apostle's name. And in like manner, chastely and with shame, you women should adorn yourselves, said he, and not with braided hair or jewelry, with pearl or golden ornament. What next? I'll pay as much attention to your text and rubric in such things as would a gnat. And once you said that I was like a cat, for if you singe a cat it will not roam, and that's the way to keep a cat at home. But when she feels her fur is sleek and, and gay, she can't be kept indoors for half a day. But off she takes, at dusk, as dusk is falling, to show her fur and go a caterwauling. Which means if I feel gay, as you suppose, I shall run out and show my poor old clothes? Silly old fool, you and your private spies. Go on, beg Argus with his hundred eyes to be my bodyguard. That's better still. But, he sh but yet he shan't, I say, against my will. I'll pull him by the beard, believe you me. And once you said that principally three misfortunes trouble earth, 
east, west, and north, and no man living could endure a fourth? My dear Sir Shrew, Jesu cut short your life. You preach away and say a hateful wife is reckoned to be one of three misfortunes. Is there no other trouble that importunes the world and that your parables could condemn? Must an unhappy wife be one of them? Then you compared a woman's love to hell, to barren land where water will not dwell. And you compared it to a quenchable fire. The more it burns, the more it is its desire. To burn up everything that burnt can be. You say that just as worms destroy a tree, a wife destroys her husband and contrives, as husband knows, to the ruin of their lives. Such was the way, my lords, you understand. I kept my older husbands well in hand. I told them they were drunk, and their unfitness to judge my conduct forced me to take witness that they were lying. Johnny and my niece would back me up. Oh, Lord, I wrecked their peace, innocent as they were, without remorse, for I could bite and whinny like a horse and launch complaints when things were all my fault. I'd have been lost if I had called a halt. First to the mill is first to grind your corn. I attacked first, and they were overborne, glad to apologize and even suing pardon for what they'd never thought of doing. I'd tackle one for wenching out of hand, although so ill the man could hardly stand, yet he felt f flattered in his heart because he thought it showed how fond of him I was. I swore that all my walking out at night was just to keep his wenching well in sight. That was a dodge that made me shake with mirth. But all such wit is given us at birth. Lies, tears, and spinning are the things God gives. By nature, a woman while she lives. So there's one thing at least that I can boast, that in the end I always ruled the roast. Cunning or force was sure to make them stumble and always keeping up a steady grumble. By bedtime, above all, was their misfortune. That was the place to scold to scold them and importune and balk their fun. I would never abide in bed with them if the hands began to slide till they had promised ransom, paid a fee, and then I let them do their nicety. And so I tell this tale to every man, it's all for sale, and let him win who can. No empty-handed man can lure a bird. His pleasures were my profit, I concurred. Even assumed fictitious appetite, though bacon may never give me much delight. And that's the very fact that made me chide them. And had the Pope been sitting there beside them, I would have spared them at their very table, but paid them out as far as I was able. I say, so help me God omnipotent, were I to make my will and testament, I owe them nothing, paid them word for word, putting my wits to use, and they preferred to give it up and take it for the best, for otherwise they would get no rest. Though they might glower like a maddened beast, they got no satisfaction, not the least. I then would say, my dear, just take a peep. What a meek look on Wilkin our sheep. Come nearer, husband, let me kiss your cheek. You should be just as patient, just as meek. Sweeten your heart, your conscience needs a probe. You're fond of preaching patience out of Job, and so be patient, practice what you preach, and if you don't, my dear, we'll have to teach you that it's nice to have a quiet life. One of us must be master, man or wife, and since a man's more reasonable he should be the patient one, you must agree. What ails you, man, to grumble so and groan? Just that you want my what-not all your own? Why, take it all, man, take it every bit. St. Peter, what a love you have for it. For if I were to sell my bell shows, I could go walking fresher than a rose, but I will keep it for your private tooth. By God, you are to blame, and that's the truth. That's how my first three husbands were undone, 
Now let me tell you of my last but one. He was a reveler with number four. That is to say, he kept a paramour. And I was young, ah, raggery's the word, stubborn and strong and jolly as a bird. Play me the harp, and I would dance and sing, believe me, like a nightingale in spring, if I had had a drought of sweetened wine. Metellius, that filthy lout, the swine, who snatched a staff and took his woman's life for drinking wine, if I had been his wife, he never would have daunted me for, from drink. Whenever I take wine, I have to think of Venus, for as cold engenders hail, a lecherous mouth begets a lecherous tail. A woman in her cups has no defense, as lechers know from long experience. But Christ, whenever it comes back to me, when I recall my youth and jollity, it fairly warms the cockles of my heart. This very day I feel a pleasure start. Yes, I can feel it tickling at the root. Lord, how it does me good. I've had my fruit, I've had my word and time, I've had my fling, but age that comes to poison everything has taken all my beauty and my pith. Well, let it go. The devil go therewith. The flower is gone, there is no more to say, and I must sell the bran as best I may, but still I mean to find my way to fun. Now, let me tell you of my last but one. I told you how it filled my heart with spite, to see another woman his delight. By God and all his saints I made it good. I carved him out a cross of the same wood, not with my body in a filthy way, but certainly by seeming rather gay to others, frying him in his own grease of jealousy and rage. He got no peace. By God on earth I was his purgatory, for which I hope his soul may be in glory. God knows he sang a sorry tune, he flinched, and bitterly enough, when the shoe pinched. And God and he alone can say how grim, how many were the ways I tortured him. He died when I came back from Jordan's stream, and he lies buried under the roof beam. I'll abate that his tomb can scarce supply us with such a show as that of King Darius. Apollos sculpted it in a sumptuous taste, but costly burial would have been mere waste. Farewell to him. God give his spirit rest. He's in his grave. He's nailed up in his chest. Now of my fifth late husband, let me tell. God never let his soul be sent to hell. And yet he was my worst, and many a blow he struck me still can ache along my row of ribs and will until my dying day.